today I'd like to tell you a story about one thread of my research that involves moving and thinking. These are video games that were built as an intervention for children on the autism spectrum. And that led to a um, unique internship program that followed from it. So to start this, I need to tell you a little bit about autism. Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. The current prevalence rates in the United States is one in 59, making it very, very common. When most people think about autism, they think about a child. However, autism is a lifelong disorder, and that actually has serious cost implications. In 2015, the estimated annual cost for autism in the States was $236 billion. However, the estimated cost for 2025, when these children are becoming young adults, is going to balloon to 461 billion at a minimum. We have relatively few interventions. We need more. We have a very broad spectrum of, of people on the, um, people on the spectrum represent a very broad spectrum of talents and abilities. About two thirds of individuals have um, uh, average or better uh, intellectual skills. But all of them who show this diagnosis have challenges with social communication, interacting in the world that was constructed by neurotypical people. So about six years ago, my colleague Jean Townsend and I created an intervention, or funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health, um, to create this particular intervention for training a specific type of attention, this orienting aspect of attention, and it's among the first signs in autism. So when you see a child with autism who is not following you, when you, when you call his name and he doesn't turn toward you, it's that type of attention. Attention is a very broad construct. And we use a feature that we know of in the brain that the attention circuits are shared with the circuits that guide gaze behavior. There's a great little trick in that that I can use because if I ask you to look here or here or here, I could measure the speed with which you look to that point and how accurately you move there. Right? That's measurable. It's really tough to measure the covert aspects of attention, like I'm asking you to look here and detect something over here. Okay? So we're using movement as a harness to train the entire system. The video games we made are unique in that they're played with your eyes. Okay? There's an eye tracker attached to the screen. We don't use a mouse, we don't use a touch screen. The other unique aspect of our intervention is that we send these games home. This is also kind of unusual because we need you to play for about four or five days a week, approximately 20 to 30 minutes each time. That's just not reasonable to ask people to come to the lab to get that kind of training, but that's the kind of training, much like exercise, we want people to engage in order to be successful. Here are some screenshots of our games. Each of these games has a uh, unique training principle embedded in it. So for instance, um, Shroom, Shroom Digger right here in the, in the middle top has, uh, is focused on training different aspects of uh, steady fixation. You're seeking out those mushroom houses to blow them up. A number of our games have aspects of response inhibition embedded in there, trying to get you to um, avoid being distracted. This video game that I'm about to show you is one of the three originals, um, and it's uh, based on a classic whack-a-mole game. And what you're gonna do here, that, that, that gray circle is a representation of the player's gaze, is you're gonna hit the ninja moles as they pop up, okay? Um, and so you just keep looking at those to whack them back into the hole, and the principle here is to integrate your attention over a broad area um, and make a fast and accurate eye movement to each of the targets as they pop up. But be careful, because everything that pops up on the screen isn't necessarily a target. They start centrally, and then they will actually sort of um, come in, in different areas, even parachuting from the sky. But in a moment, there's going to be a warning signal that the next target that comes up is not. There's that warning signal. This is a professor mole. We don't hit professors at UCSD, okay? That, that's one of those inhibitory control moments. Don't hit the guy with the glasses, okay? So this is actually quite challenging, and our kids find it so, but they get much better over practice. Okay, here's some results from a very small clinical trial that we conducted. Um, I told you that attention is a very broad construct, um, but the, the type of attention that we targeted is this fast orienting, and you can see that comparing pre to post, the amount of improvement we got was quite significant. We also measured some significant um, inhibition to distraction, which is embedded in our games. 
There's a, yet another uh, construct which we saw some improvement in, but not everyone on the autism spectrum has that particular um, type of challenge, and that's this focus, more like what you think of as ADHD. Um, this type of attention tends to um, keep you uh, from, from staying on task, and that's, uh, like I said, less common, but of the individuals who had it, um, some of them improved. At this point, I wanted to pause and say that my moment of change came actually with the success of that trial, right? We have next steps in the lab. We want to actually conduct a much larger trial that is placebo-controlled, and we're also creating games to take uh, the intervention that we've created down to younger kids, ages three to six, because that's an age where I think we can actually get the training to have a greater impact over the course of one's life. But because we really wanted these interventions to get out into the world, they're much needed, we, we needed to create a company. My colleague Jean and I um, were being asked if we could share our games either with families who'd been part of our trial or with people who are from elsewhere who really wanted to participate. And so there was really no way to share except for to start a company. And then on the research side, we found that many of our fellow investigators were asking us, how did you do this? I have a good idea for a research game, but how do you actually get started? How do you figure out how to design? How do you develop these games? So um, with support from the Qualcomm Institute, we were able to found the Power of Neurogaming, or Pong Center, um, that allowed us to provide these resources to the UCSD community and the San Diego community at large. We have many people coming to us um, asking for different types of help to make sensor-enabled games or games for education. And none of these changes, these challenges, um, uh, would have happened without the incredible resources and support of the Qualcomm Institute. This is very interdisciplinary in its mission and um, in both research and social innovation. So I wanted to take a moment and flag that because that, this um, lab work that I've done has now gone in multiple different directions. So with Pong, we found that we had some unique opportunities. We saw that we could, because people love video games, <laughs> at least the people that I've been working with. Um, and we found that, that we have this unique opportunity to use video games as an, a, a way to encourage an ecosystem of learning around computer science, around research. And so we started doing that. We started sponsoring hackathons, right, or challenges in hackathons. We started taking in more students to be involved, not just in research, but in building the games. But then I realized, and, and some colleagues were sort of poking me to say, Leanne, you're not pushing this far enough. So when I was going out and interacting with people who were part of our intervention, I saw some amazing talent. I saw people, who, um, people on the autism spectrum who were making art, making animations, they're making their own video games, but this talent was untapped. It was stuck in their homes. They were not out sharing it with the world. What if we can create an internship program based around video games that are beloved? to train job skills, both hard and soft skills that are needed in order to succeed in the workplace. And this is important because one of the things I didn't tell you about autism is the statistics for adults. There's this, this concept called a services cliff, which sounds severe because it is. Um, in the States, services tend to end at the end of high school. So just when the young adult needs support in order to succeed in life, they, their support ends. So we're seeking to um, add to that support through this type of internship program that can support anyone who's graduated from high school um, and, and looking for jobs. And this, this image is uh, for, forecasting the uh, showcase that I'll tell you about, about the internship program. Actually, let me, let me just back up a second and tell you that um, we succeeded in getting some support for this, we convinced the San Diego Foundation to take a chance on us and support a um, summer program, just happened this past summer, 25 young adults, 90% of whom self-identify on the spectrum, working together in groups of five to create a sensor-enabled video game with a particular research focus. That means that they designed, they developed, they um, tested this video game, right? Um, and, and then they shared it in this showcase. We also had five coaches working with these teams, and the coaches were unique in that they are really talented young people, right? They had excellent leadership skills, excellent empathy, but they weren't trained as clinical psychologists or anything. They're just undergraduates or um, recent graduates, and they provided the support for this program. I think that's really special because that's something that can be replicated elsewhere. So right now I want to share with you a little video 
um, that was made in week six of our eight-week intervention program, so we're now at the testing phase, and I, this is going to tell you really fast <laughs> about the five video games that were here. So this is a VR video game that is actually an attention assessment that's mimicking a classic attention task called the attention network task, right? And, and so giving us the same data. This is a balanced training game called Equilibrium. So we're seeing somebody go through this by shifting their weight back and forth, training, uh, and this is the, the starting screen, picking up um, bonuses and avoiding obstacles. This is much easier than the actual game, that's why it starts this way. This is our very first attempt at making a game for toddlers and preschoolers. This is Balloon Pop. There's actually a little one sitting in that chair right there. You'll meet her in a moment. Um, there she is. <laughs> she liked it. <laughs> this game is called Need Space. That long bar in front is an eye tracker. It actually is for two people. So this might very well be the first two-person eye tracking game. I can't find any evidence anyone's done it before. It's a, called a rail shooter game where one person is actually driving the ship, steering, and the other person is aiming with their eyes to shoot in order to get through that asteroid field. This is really cool because you can work together socially in order to succeed in the game. Our last game is called Sight Seekers, and it was designed for your older adults to get out and go walking more. It uses kind of a Pokemon Go type of mechanic in order to get out and move around, but there's something more to it than that. With the cell phone, you're not only looking to navigate to the next place, but once you're there, you're asked multiple questions with respect to where you were. So draw for me on the phone where the place you last visited. And that's a nice test that's um, ethologically val val valid um, about navigation, and that's one of the important predecessors of dementia. Okay. And as you can see, the art was a big deal for some of the, the participants. Okay, this is a, some images of the beautiful showcase that we got to present um, for the, the interns at the uh, Qualcomm Institute. And it was a really, really powerful event. We learned a lot during this internship program. Uh, one thing in particular was that it wasn't the video games per se, I think that made it. It was the, the fact that video games have this thing that we actually embedded in our internship that others can as well and benefit from. And it's the idea that, you know, there are rules for work just like there are rules for games. But for games, you get to test and explore and do different types of um, skill building and fail. And the failing is okay. In fact, you're supposed to fail and just hit the reset button, right? We allowed that in our internship too. In fact, we encouraged it. Please fail, fail fast, you know, fail again, but try, get outside of your comfort zone and try something new. And I think it, it really worked and it made people feel comfortable. In fact, one of our interns said that for the very first time, he felt comfortable working here. We also got some data from surveys that said that the pre to post inclination toward work moved from I'm, I'm primarily working because I want money to I'm working for self-efficacy because I want to because I enjoy it. I find that really powerful. I'm up here today, I'm so excited to be sharing this with you because I love what I do, right? And I want you to share that with you. And I hope for that for all of our interns. We got some negative feedback too. We were told that our computers were too slow. If you want, to make, if you want us to make video games, you need to get us faster computers. We'll note that one for the next time. This is all of us. Um, all 25 of us, plus some staff and our coaches, we are looking forward to together building an ecosystem of learning for a healthy and happy future of work where all of us can enjoy productive and personally fulfilling lives, taking our own creativity and talents and embedding them in the work that we do. Thank you. <laughs>